Good evening and welcome. It's eight o'clock on a Monday and it's our LGS Operative Surgery Day and we have none other than Ilango Setu, a dedicated teacher uh, to continue his uh, series on uh, uh, vascular anastomosis. This is the fourth actually. Uh, the first one is on ball anastomosis and he's done three on vascular anastomosis and I think this is the last one on vascular anastomosis before he moves to another anastomosis. And uh, today, uh, actually, there are a lot of inquiries and a lot of uh, messages asking uh, for a video record of uh, the previous lectures and uh, these lectures are being edited and they'll be uh, put up in Learning General Surgery and YouTube in the coming week or this week, a uh, couple of them this week and others next week. And um, you can always see those uh, recordings there. And uh, there are a couple of others who said that we will not be able to attend because of our duty, this, that, and the other. Of course, this is going live on LGS uh, Facebook. You can always go to LGS Facebook and watch it there if you don't have an access to Zoom. And this recording in Lenway will um, come into the YouTube LGS channel soon. Uh, with those few words, I again welcome Ilango and uh, over to you. Sir, thank you. Um, good evening to everyone. This is the last uh, session of the vascular anastomosis series, which, which we are doing. <clears throat> so a brief overview. I think uh, we have done all the theoretical part. Today, we are going to show two videos, a simple technique for you to do a closure and a simple technique for you to follow for an end-to-end -end anastomosis. Those are the only two techniques. Like I said before, there are more than, uh, there are many ways to skin the cat and I'm teaching you the simplest method which you would do in a crisis. <clears throat> vascular surgery is not something you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you do on a day-to-day -day basis, this lecture will be too, <clears throat> too easy for you. So um, I, my assumption is that most of you are going to do uh, vascular surgery as a rarity. I was just listening to a lecture from the London Business School. Um, it was titled, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. So uh, vascular injuries tend to behave like that and just follow these tips and tricks. And if you can remember them, they can make your day on a bad day at your operating table. So let's start. So this is a video of how to close a hole in the blood vessel. It's a very simple video. Um, if you have I lost can't a large see the video, Ilango. Uh, is it good? Okay, okay. Yeah, yes. All you right. Can, can you see now? Yeah. So uh, I've not just started running it. So uh, the uh, if the hole is too large and does you have lost a segment of the vein, this is probably not the technique for you to use. But at present, I think um, this is the best technique for you to learn to stop a bleeding. Okay, so I'm starting. Uh, let me go back to the first. So here we have a longitudinal defect in the blood vessel. And if you watch me, I'm using a 6 so proline. You take the bite at one end of the uh, hole. Both the bites, vascular structures, it's good to do inside out. Watch the angle. Go inside out. And like I've always said, square the first one, slip knot for the second, and then square again. So um, you will tend to know how to uh, tie those knots by practice. Now watch how the vessels are being held. So I don't want you to hold the inside of the vessel. Now, even if you have to put it, just use one part of your uh, pickup to open the vessel and then take. If you crush the vessel, the intima will crack. So either you hold the adventitia or you use one limb of your pickup to just open the vessel, even in an end-to-end -end anastomosis, like I'll, how I'll show you. So now the first stitch is to hitch. There, is, there are a couple of ways to do this very well. If you come, uh, if, you're, if you have enough number of 
vascular sutures, you can do a similar stitch at the lower end of the uh, wound and then work up all the way up and then tie the knot in the middle. Uh, it's not always that you have a vascular suture. So I'm teaching you a technique which you can use in a real crisis. So you have got only one suture and you, you have hitched it to the upper end of the, what we call as the north side of the stitch. And then you're going to start sewing over. Now watch the needle tip, how it enters the blood vessel. It's what, what I want. Okay, I'm holding it. Gentle rolling. At right angle, it goes inside and one smooth and see how the needle is pulled out along the curvature of the needle. Simple depth one, make it vertical and just go through. And you can see the needle holder loading it. And then you angulate it. Just comes with practice. Just comes with practice. Perfect insight, okay. And then go along the curve of the needle. It's as simple as uh, suturing skin. See the distance between the two uh, sutures, the intersutural distance in a vascular uh, suture must be equal. It will give you the best results. But not all the time when you in a bleeding vessel, you may not be able to get it perfectly. So it's okay as long as you control. And if the vessel seems distorted, you may have to change your strategy. So the, the technique which you are seeing here, now watch how it is taking the bite, holding it open. Okay. Load it just outside on the tissue. So you don't waste much time. You don't have to take it out, load it again. It's almost like, like a, a dance. Right? So you go to the end of the wound. Just a couple more stitches. So on the operating field, uh, you will still have blood. So you would have applied clamps on both the sides or you would have applied journalis. But anyway, the inside portion, you have to wash with heparinized saline. Like in the first lecture, I taught you how to do a heparinized saline. You wash the inside thoroughly so that the endothelium is clean, the intima is clean and all the blood clots within are washed out. So this is very, very important in a vascular suturing. So keep that. And at the end of your suturing, you'll have a small opening and use that opening to flush finally with heparinized saline so that any clot will come out and the vessel will be completely filled and you won't back wall the last stitch. Hmm. problems in the laboratory. Yeah. So evenly placed sutures. Now, this is the difficulty. So in a real life situation, use that small defect, fill it with uh, heparinized saline, and you will be able to take the bite safely. So go beyond. And now using one of the loops you can still tie it off securely. So this is in a crisis situation when you've got 
only a few vascular sutures. But if you work in a large unit like mine, you can use two of them and still get a great result. Okay. <clears throat> so just for a demonstration, uh, the, the vessel became too dry. So we were advised to wet it before we continue the demonstration. So the suture line is good and it will be secure. There's no issue on that. You, have, you just have to cut and see to see the perfection. So let me share the next video. Uh, do you have any questions from the first video? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I have some questions on the chat box. Okay. All right. Um, this is some uh, any of the simple questions, Please unmute and ask, please. Any, any question related to vascular any. surgery, feel free. Okay. I assume, is it about, uh, is it easy for you to follow up or uh, you can ask any question? And, and very easy, I should know. say, Ilongo. Okay. So, okay. you know, you're, you're, you're spoon feeding. Anyway, uh, any questions you can always discuss at the end of the lecture. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the simplest method of end-to-end -end arterial anastomosis that you can do. The key, uh, <clears throat> see when you do an end-to-end -end arterial anastomosis, you must align the vessel properly. So normally your first and uh, next stitches will be at three o'clock and nine o'clock position. And uh, you can either keep the vessel that way and suture from inside out and the anterior wall normally uh, from outside in. But this is a much more simpler technique which I learned from Dr. Christopher B. Hughes, okay? So the first stitch he takes at 12 o'clock or six o'clock, it will be anteroposterior so that he needs to rotate the vessel only about 90 degrees so the vessel doesn't get twisted. So on a loosely dissected vessel, this is a much simpler technique to use. So this is what we are going to demonstrate today, okay? Like even the sutures, uh, we follow a method called the total suturing, which is uh, very, very simple. We use it for bile duct all the time. It's almost similar to, to do that. It comes from outside in and then inside out. And if the vessel looks very bad, take it inside out on both the sides because most of the vascular sutures are going to be double armed. Uh, you can either shard it or you can tie it. So this time we wanted to show how to shard it. So we are sharding it. Sorry, it was shot under macro photography. So you're not able to see how the shards are being placed. Now I'm on the vessel, I've marked the 12 o'clock position using a red marker. So normally I use the skin marker. So watch. Again, I tell you if the vessel is of very bad quality, take both the sides bites from inside out. So we were doing this for about three or four hours. So this was the last anastomosis and uh, we were making everybody bleed. So we couldn't spend much time. So we have shorted both the ends. So uh, for an appropriate demonstration, I'm, I'm making it, giving some length to follow. So this is how it will be. So I'm tying the first knot. Okay, watch how the knots may slip. I always tell you, square the first one. Now it's become loose, okay? 
don't worry, just throw a slip knot. It'll sit perfectly. The third one is a squared knot and you have it locked perfectly. You have it locked perfectly. So you don't have to struggle. Somebody need not hold the suture. The vascular sutures are very thin. And if you hold them tightly with any instrument other than the shards, it, it's likely to get damaged. So, all right. so I do three knots, my colleague does four. Um, so we're going to demonstrate. So if you rotate 90 degrees. I wonder if I can interrupt you here for a minute. Yeah, yeah. See the proline, how many knots are you supposed to? Because you said three and that your friend does four. Mm, I mean, isn't it, I mean, uh, uh, taught uh, no. minimum of six knots. Is that uh, truth? Uh, sir, that is at the end suture. This is the starting suture. Mm. If we put six knots there, mm. then uh, you will have a knotty layer at the, at the penultimate stitch. So this is only to hitch the stitch. Okay. The final okay. one, I throw, I throw eight knots. The final okay. what, finishing What, what knot, is, is the size of the thread has got anything to do with the number of knots? Nothing, sir. Same. Even oh. eight zero, we do the same thing. How many knots do you normally? Six to eight. Six, six to I eight. do eight. Right, right. Okay, all right. So, but for the starting suture, if you put more, you can see that, no, this is quite small, but on a macro right. photograph, you can see there's a couple of knots here. So right, if you right, put just right. three, you will not be able to see that. That's all. Right. So right. watch me, I'm holding one end and I'm just supporting the vessel. So always the second bite should be taken individually. Now it sits. And now it, you can do it just like how you close the defect. You can see how the needle is rotated so that the entry point is at right angle. And then same equidistant from the cut edge and equidistant from the other knot, other uh, suture. So you maintain a good intersutural distance. Is Pari there? He's not there. I am there. Oh. Yep. Pari. <laughs> Why are you in darkness, Pari? We can't see you. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Pari, uh, will you do me the uh, uh, chat box yeah, sure. moderation? Yeah. Sure, I'll do that. And your Ramarawani's comments... question. Mm. Okay, so sh should I fire a question now or you yep. want to take it later? Uh, I, this, the sutures are routine, isn't it? So you can do it. Happy yeah, so Dr. Amaravani, uh, uh, his question is what if you don't take anterior knots, continue taking interrupted after six o'clock, what will happen? I'm not able to understand. Why don't you, what if you don't take the anterior knots and continue to take interrupted knots? Nothing will happen. This is just one method. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I, very small vessels, uh, I do interrupted. Like, Pari, you also do interrupted for very small switches. Isn't it? True, true. Yeah. Reasonably good sized vessels. So see how the knot is adjusted. Could not twist the vessel a lot because of we had to pin it. Load mm. on the tissue. Answer to Dr. Amaravani's question, uh, Lango. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, one of the couple of reasons why you take anterior is one, you know how much distance you need to leave on either side so that you don't uh, have lesser chance of leaving a dog here at the end. If you do, if you're not taking the anterior suture then you tend to you know, uh, take a longer bite on one side and shorter on the other side. And once you take the anterior, the opposition is also is going to make taking uh, further switches easier. 
So that is the reason why anterior suture is also taken, the toloclar suture. There are some uh, surgeons who do it in a clock face uh, manner, uh, but it all depends on your orientation of the vessel. Uh, if you're able to perfectly orient it and avoid the dog ears, um, any, any method works. Amal sir always says, you know, vascular surgery is just like skin surgery. Nothing very typical about it. It just takes practice um, and a lot of patience. Uh, normally, we both follow the, this method for hepatic arteries, uh, anastomosis, very quite simple method. I haven't done hepatic artery with you for a long time, buddy. Isn't it? Mm. One and a half years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. You used to do uh, three o'clock or nine o'clock switches, uh, rotate and do. Mm -hmm. Three and nine, yes, uh, place three yeah. and nine. And then uh, if it's a big vessel, I just do the posterior wall and then uh, yeah. do anterior. So here is uh, first knot, second knot, third knot. Sorry for the, just keeping going. Uh, this was because we were using it most of the time <laughs> in the laboratory. We had to. If I can ask both of you <clears throat> one question. See, uh, you know, how you always talk about practice outside the operating table. What all should be purchased and from where to learn vascular surgery? Where do you get this stuff which you're using? So this is very difficult to procure now, at least. This is beef iota. I think uh, Ethicon had some frozen stuff, which they were very glad to share with us for the LGS video specifically. And um, that is why this was made. But normally what I do is, uh, I Ethicon also supplies a suture board. The suture board has a small circular portion where you can stretch a glove and you can practice uh, fine suturing. Uh, it's actually meant for microvascular suturing, but um, I guess you can use six zeros. Uh, okay. Tying knots on six zeros is a skill you have to learn. It comes by practice. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we transplant surgeons are not magicians. It's just that we have done this routinely several number of times. Uh, during my training days, I used to take at least eight to 10 um, um, sutures with me every day, pretty much every day. And uh, I had a small rubber sponge shaped like a kidney. I'll just place it and uh, I'll just throw knots. And I used to carry the threads everywhere. I used to wait while the anesthetist comes, finishes the work or I'll be waiting for the organ to come. All those times I was just putting knots. I mean, I was, I was a trained surgeon, but you have to do it consistently good to be a transplant surgeon. So you just keep repeatedly doing this over and over again. I mean, uh, you, if you watch me, I'm not, nobody's even throwing, um, uh, spraying water on my hands. If you have noticed that. Uh, Pari and me have very different styles. We worked in the same unit and worked together. And for Pari, they will spray water on his hands or, or saline on his hands. But for me, they will never do that. Uh, part of the reason is because I did most of these knot trainings in the dry lab or in a dry situation. So I got used to the fact that sometimes even seven zero sutures you can handle without having uh, uh, Unless your glove is sticky, I don't use much of uh, the spray. 
uh, you will get used to it. It comes by practice. It's not, it does not come on the operative field is what I feel. And roughly with eight sutures, you can throw about like 300, 400 knots and you will get to a point where you get perfect at it. And if you persist with it, yes, there's, it's a different ball game together. You can do it very well and it will serve you in situations where you are in a crisis and you have to get out of the crisis all these techniques will help you uh, to do a more effective and uh, perfect surgery. That's my take on it. So practice is very, very essential skill for anastomosis, not tyings. Um, it's very, very awkward to have one assistant. I mean, I'm, now I fortunately have very senior people, uh, but sometimes you end up with uh, teaching junior surgeons and you're doing some incision honey as you get very young people to assist you. It's very awkward to see them tying, uh, taking time to tie the knots. Um, that is, I think, a, a, a gap in the student's learning. You have to spend time. It does not come uh, easily. And doing that again and again will help you better. Okay, let's go on with the video. We're starting. some focusing issues. Yeah, this is quite an unedited video. So you can see how my needle is forward loaded and how the angle is at right angle to the surface of the vessel. Always taken two. Stitch number two is always taken two. So you can see my mistake, it's a sort of tiredness. I try to hold the vessel, stabilizing it, it's just to avoid dog gearing. Um, but normally never ever hold the vessel um, uh, with, with pressure. It, the intima will crack down and you'll get, get into a bigger problem than just the hole. What is Pari's view on wetting the hands? <clears throat> I thought that is mandatory because I didn't know yeah. The, yeah. the reason behind, but uh, always, uh, uh, you know, hands they need to be wet. Yeah, what happens is um, <coughs> invariably we have some blood, uh, half clotted blood. And then in the gloves, the smaller sutures, especially seven O's and eight O's and even six O's, they tend to stick to the uh, uh, you know the blood in the gloves basically the gloves become a little sticky and then it doesn't uh, slide as well if it is uh, on a semi-dry gloves so uh, splashing some saline on the uh, gloves makes slipping the knot easier and safer otherwise you tend to if it doesn't slip in you tend to break the knot so I think most of the surgeons would prefer uh, having a water splashed on their gloves while uh, throwing uh, knots on uh, smaller sutures like seven O's, eight O's and six O's. So I always uh, make sure that somebody splashes water on my gloves. So if this is uh, normal saline that's been uh, splashed through a syringe or what is it? Uh, normal saline, even heparinase saline is also okay. Uh, any saline, both no, either normal saline or heparinase saline. Yeah. So um, the, that what both of you are discussing is correct. What happened to me was that um, um, when somebody throws water on the field, uh, my focus tends to go off. So um, during my uh, practice sessions, I was wearing the loop and I didn't have a nurse to assist me. It's not that uh, uh, it comes easy. Uh, your method is the standard method. But I, I was working in the lab. Uh, nobody will come and assist me. I would do a, a transplant and I would go and sit in the lab um, trying to do something, what I learned in the previous surgery, trying to perfect what. So at that time, there is nobody to assist you. 
you tend to do things slightly differently. Uh, that is how I became proficient in tying uh, six zeros. But when I landed in MIOT, these girls will not know what, uh, when to give me the water, I mean, sp spray the water. So I learned how to do seven O's without breaking the knot. And except for eight zeros, I, I, I asked them to spray a little bit just to wet my hands. They can't do it continuously. Uh, you get used to it. It's not mandatory. But for a young surgeon, yeah, probably I will say that's by what Pari is teaching you and what Patasar is telling you is the standard. Over time, when you practice in a dry lab, you get good enough uh, to a point. Um, and you can do it without assistance. That's all. There's, there's nothing to begin it. Remember, we got three questions <coughs> up now. You want yeah, to take yeah. So, now just, just we'll we'll finish this and I'll show them. Okay. And I can take it. It's just the last stitch. A, a word here, Ilango. Uh, actually, I remember uh, you know you release the clamps to let the air bubble out. Is is that a routine or is okay correct, correct, it... correct, 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 correct. Uh, it's mandatory. <clears throat> no, you have to release. You have to release. Uh, so the clamp release order is like this for me, uh, distal clamp first, then you let it bleed out, de-air the anastomosis and then tie. Uh, okay. Once you have sufficiently de-aired, you can do this. The other way is to have, leave a small hole to de-air, you can fill the entire blood vessel with heparinized saline. So you don't lose blood as well and you can keep the field clean. Either of those two techniques will be useful. I've seen the coronary surgeons keeping a benflon in the, the lumen. I've seen that. I mean, instead of uh, sort of uh, um, uh, allowing a big gap, I don't, I don't know, my, I, Dr. Bashi will be coming here in this uh, forum uh, uh, doing a um, coronary bypass operation. Uh, but uh, have you seen uh, a, a small benflon like thing across the anastomosis to release air? Uh, no, sir, I have never kept anything like that. I'm really you, scared of putting something. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen one being done, but uh, it makes sense. Probably, I think it's not a bad idea to do that. I think it makes sense totally. Um, so, the one advantage of training in a lab is to see your own results. It's almost a kind of audit. So, you I always cut and see the vessels inside. You cannot do this in a, uh, the actual operative table. You can see your mistakes very clearly and you can perfect them. It's not that all of us don't make mistakes. We all have our problems, but it can be corrected. Okay, Pari, I can take the questions. Yeah, okay. So, there's no photo. A friend, uh, Lado is here today. Okay. He's Right. Uh, okay, one of the questions. What is the concentration of epsilon? I guess you might have told in earlier sessions. Somebody yeah, wants to... Yeah. So 5,000 units in fine, it's 10 units per ml. Okay, so that answers it. Uh, from Dr. Nagarajan, how does patulation vary uh, the clock portion of the starting suture? He wants to know if you have patulated <coughs> one of the vessels, where is your starting suture? Or what uh, clock portion are you going to place the starting suture? It's pretty much the same. Um, so in a spatulated position, a spatulated vessel, you have a toe and a heel. So use one of them as six o'clock and the other one as 12 o'clock. So the direction will decide how it's going to be fixed, but we can use the same clock position for the starting suture. For the spatulated vessel, Last time, we, it's an end-to-side anastomosis. Or you mean end-to-end -end spatulated vessel? Is that what he meant? Yeah, I guess so. I, I think he's so. meaning an end-to-end -end spatulated vessel. Spatulated vessel. I, you can use the same rules. There is no change in that. Okay. Um, and then from Dr. Basant, what is the preferred approach when there is luminal disparity during end-to-end -end anastomosis? So the smallest vessel if you have a luminal disparity, I mean, then, then the number of sessions will really go up. If you have luminal disparity, either you make a cut 
on one of the uh, on the smaller vessel and then you will get a slightly wider anastomosis you can actually uh, uh, make a, an oblique cut. This is almost like a spatulation. Again, you will get the, uh, the right luminal. The other one is preferring an end to side anastomosis on the larger vessel. That's also will work. So can you put your video on? Mm. Can you? One more question from Dr. Amravani. Distal clamp out First, same as intestinal anastomosis. Okay, I think it's more of a comment. Okay, and uh, from our friend, Dr. Lado. Mm. Look, I'm talking about your camera to see your face. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Dr. Lado, okay. you can uh, unshare. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Lado, Dr. question is, which do you prefer, vein graft or PTFE? When you when we have serious damage of vascular wall, for example, during trauma, for example, when we have damage of the portal confluence, we use graft on the left renal vein or GSP. So he's asking if we have a trauma, you have to put in a graft or a, would you prefer putting in a PTFE or a vein graft? Yes. So um, a PTFE, I mean, I will prefer a vein graft as a, I mean, it's easily available. It's the safest option. Um, I would use a PTFE when I have no venous options and then I don't have any uh, gut contamination as well. Um, and having said that, we've used quite a bit of PTFE and did not find any difficulty when, they, when we have a biliary anastomosis. So it's a good uh, graft material, but my preference still is a natural vein graft. Uh, but when we have not enough time to make a venous graft, uh, for example, the, when the bleeding is so serious, uh, can we just use small part of PTFE? Was good? Uh, yeah, life saving. Yeah, you can just put it on. And then once the bleeding is controlled, you have all the time to take out a vein graft and redo the anastomosis. And I don't think so. See, uh, some of the things we can learn is that. Uh, the easily available veins are the inferior mesenteric vein. It gives a good length and you can make a patch out of it. Um, renal vein is a good patch. So uh, if you don't have time for it, yes, use a EPTFE, finish it, stabilize the patient. And then if you are not comfortable leaving it for a long time, you can do that. And uh, yeah. can be, for example, when we have problem in abdominal cavity, can we make graft from greater saphenous vein? I want several yes, times. You can. Made... Yes, yes, yes. You can use the great saphenous vein. I mean, <laughs> there was one time uh, my boss used uh, used that to make a small segment of the vena cava. So just spiral it. Uh, you can use it. It's a very good vein, actually. It's robust, sutures hold perfectly. And uh, yes. It can be done. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Ilango, uh, welcome. Is your uh, venous anastomosis any different from arterial anastomosis in terms of uh, your handling the tissue, the choice of suture material, or any technical difference? Uh, veins versus arteries? Um, most of the time, uh, there's a slight difference actually when we handle a vein. The vein is actually thinner, so the bite movement is much more gentle than in a thicker vessel. Um, the um, it's very difficult to demonstrate this, <clears throat> but like I how I showed the end-to-end -end anastomosis, Dr. Hughes. Um, usually does it from outside. But the clamp position is very hard to describe. Um, so I will take it like uh, modification is very minimal, that's all. I don't think so, I'll, I'll say I have a big different technique. Okay, Pare? a couple of questions, yeah. Yeah, I think the main difference in my mind is uh, when doing a vein-to-vein -vein anastomosis, we have to be really very careful with the length of the vein. 
Now, what happens is once the flow starts, the vein suddenly ex, uh, you know, expand, and then if there is uh, excess length, they kink and then they readily clot off. It's um, the problem is uh, there in the artery, but much less because the flow, the force of the flow is much greater. So artery is still little forgiving, but in the vein, you really have to get your length very right. So you really have to make sure that uh, you have to pull the vein, uh, uh, make sure that you don't leave uh, extra vein length. And redundance, yeah. That's one main difference between the artery and the vein. It's true for the artery also, but more so for the vein. If there is extra length, the vein, vein is going to uh, clog. That is the main difference in my mind. And uh, uh, growth factor, growth factor. Growth factor. And second thing is, you don't, uh, when throwing the uh, last suture, I mean, uh, when you throw the knot, you always don't try and strangle the knot onto the vein wall. You leave it little loose, leave a, a bit of a air knot so that the vein will expand and grow into it. Unlike in the artery, you don't need to really give a growth factor for the artery, but for the vein, you should always make sure that the last knot is not uh, strangulating the vein. I think these are the two major differences. The most important thing is the uh, length. If you leave too much of length on the vein, it's very easy. Uh, when the vein is collapsed, it's so easy to just, um, uh, it looks like as if it's all right, but once it starts flowing, it becomes suddenly too long. And then, you know, it doesn't uh, really uh, do any justice when the vein is too long. So I have a small rule for this. So you clean the surface, you have to cross the vein at the anastomosis, and then only you have to cut the right length. Uh, body is very, very appropriate. Any small kinking, the vessel will clot in the post-operative period. So that length is very, very important for you to do. You have to right. pull the vein, pull the vein, cross it, and then cut it. Just not putting the vein. Just, to yeah. You have to pull the vein and then cut it. You shouldn't leave too much of the length on the vein. If you permit me to ask a silly question, uh, in Angwan Pari, uh, you know, uh, when we are operating, we we'll do a gastrectomy and you know, make a hole in uh, some of the mesenteric veins, or uh, even you know, people procedure we make a small hole in the portal vein. Why should we use a three o four o silk and uh, you know, why should we run for proline? So it's not available. Is it okay? Uh, why why silk should not be used? You want to take it? Yeah, you can go ahead. I because uh, I will start slightly differently. Okay. I think. Uh, yeah. Me. There is no hard and fast rule. Um, I was trained by a surgeon called Kyle Saunders, who would never use proline on the vena cable holes. So I asked him, this is, uh, you're going through the intima. He said, no, 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 it's a fast flowing vessel. It will not get clogged. The problem with you guys is you guys use uh, APC to hold the, control the bleeding at the end of the surgery. And if you accidentally run across, the proline will melt. <laughs> you will have a disaster. But um, I mean, as a fellow, I had to agree with whatever he said. <laughs> but uh, I have not done that even once. I've never used silk on the blood vessel. Why? But in a desperate situation, yes. The uh, one, the silk disintegrates and it, it easily produces, it's a braided suture. So it will clot uh, on that spot. And if it is a very critical area, the clot is likely to extend. So I have never used. Pari? Yeah, my question is very simple. You should never use silk for blood vessels because silk is a foreign protein, extremely thrombogenic. Silk is extremely thrombogenic. The moment it comes in contact with the uh, blood vessel inside the lumen, it's going to create a clot over it. If it's a fast flowing vessel, maybe you can get away with it, but it is going to be a starting nidus for a clot formation and probably propagation. And it's a extremely brightest, which is a very uneven surface. The moment you take it, you're going to create a big seesaw-like action oh. in the, the blood vessel wall, and you're going to make the hole much bigger. And it's going to bleed. The, 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 the suture point is going to bleed more, and then you're going to take more uh, silk sutures, and then it's going to be a start of a really messy thing. It's going to clot. The vessel is good. 
So the simple answer is you should not use silk. If you don't have anything, maybe PDS is okay, acceptable, but not silk. Silk is a foreign protein, extremely thrombogenic. You, you shouldn't use. Of course, if you don't have anything and if you have to control the bleeding, fine, that's totally acceptable. You have to control the bleeding. That's, uh, that's the first uh, priority, then that's okay. If we have a better, uh, you know, the synthetic material, that is the one that we got to use. If you um, use PDS, one must be very careful uh, because whatever sudden PDS might disintegrate later doesn't work well on uh, arteries. Yeah, that's why we don't use PDS. That second better. Desperate uh, circumstances, yeah. yeah. Somebody wants a lecture on AV fistula, uh, Dr. Lado himself, and Dr. Karuna and Dr. Patel. I guess you, you uh, have the you have the best person talking about it, Pari. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Pari has, that yeah. goes to four hundred. Yeah, it's very difficult to demonstrate, but if you get the macro video, I think uh, it'd be a great lecture. Do you have one, Pari. Sir, Pari does five video. or six in a week, sir. He can record it. No, no, but yeah, I don't have one, but I will try and uh, record in future. I will yeah. try and record one. No, future is uh, very long. <laughs> Wake up if you are uh, if you are ready by next Monday. Say we can. Uh, I don't have a case posted between now and Monday, sir. But uh, the next case I do, I will try and get a, a, a close. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that is. Uh, and of course, there's so much, so much to be talked about. Uh, the true, true, true. Mm -hmm. yeah. How to, and then Dr. Vijay Raj Patil asked how to reorient after vein has been divided during the portal reception during ripples. If you forget to mark before dividing. You know, go. What, what? Okay. So uh, if you have just divided, uh, if you have divided the splenic vein and um, then it's a lot more difficult to correctly orient the vein. But if you have the splenic vein, it can serve as a three o'clock position. And then you can gently stretch the vessel to mark the nine o'clock. And then you can do the fixing sutures. Um, and if you're going to do a venous resection in a ripple, you should never forget to mark. It is the key step in doing a vascular resection. You would have done an artery first, so pretty much you'll have the entire vein in your hands and never forget to orient the vessel. Um, so that mistake can really cost the patient um, a big price. So uh, that's the key aspect. So you never forget the key aspects, um, especially when you're going to divide this clinic. Make sure you repeat it again and again in your head and get that right. Any other tips, Pati? Uh, Pari? Uh, yeah, suppose if we are not marked, had... I guess uh, he's asking, uh, given he has not marked it, so what to do? That is the question. I guess in that case, you trace the vessel all the way back to a point where it's uh, fixed. Suppose you have to trace the vessel all the way to the liver hilum or in the hyla structure where it is not mobilized. The place where it is not mobilized, it is going to be lying in its natural uh, uh, proper orientation. There you put a clamp uh, in a, a proper right angle uh, or a uh, 180 degree position so that you know which is the uh, three o'clock and which is six o'clock. Same way on the other side. You trace the vessel all the way back to a point where it is still held by the natural additions. So there it's not going to be obviously kinked or anything. So whatever is the position in that point, you got to take it. And you'll have to come back to the point of anastomosis, make sure that they all orient with each other. You, did you have occasions where you lost a, a suture with a needle in the field and, you know, because I, a gauze itself, we find it so difficult and, uh, you know, so stressful when you use so many, so many sutures and threads, do you have occasions where you lost them and how do you trace them or is it okay to close the abdomen uh, with this needle and the suture inside? Is it legal? It is not okay, but you don't have a choice. It happens once in a while, at least once a year or two, you lose, tend to lose uh, seven O's and eight O needles. And then uh, despite your best effort, many times you don't find it. 
So you just have to do, you know, bring in a, a fluoro, see all those things. Where fluoro is it possible is, to see? Nothing. It's not seen, but at least you know on for documentation, it shows that you tried everything else. You were aware of the fact, and then you used all the uh, modes at your disposal to look for it. I'm sure it's not going to be found, but at least you know that uh, you know uh, you're going to document that you tried everything. And as far as I know, these lost needles, like small needles, 7Os and 8Os, they have not caused any problems, problems. as far as I know, but I don't know what the literature is. It does happen. It's uh, not to be taken casually, but you know, uh, it's really difficult to find these needles out if you lose it. That is why you never let the sister cut too close to the needle. Always uh, cut with a big tail. If there is a bigger tail, then it's much easier to find the needle whenever it's lost. So sisters many times tend to come and uh, nurses tend to cut very close to the needle. Never do that. Or rather, you have to hold the needle with a uh, artery forceps or a mosquito forceps and then ask them to cut on the other side so that you don't lose. So the important thing is prophylaxis. You have to really be a little patient and make sure that uh, all these things are done properly. Otherwise, you are going to waste hours and hours searching for this needle, which you will never find. Correct, correct. Yeah, because I remember during my younger days uh, in Stanley, where I used to scrub for a fistler, uh, you know, to feel the thrill post surgery. Uh, you know, at till what extent do you think of a thrill, and when would you get a an equipment to you know? Visualize radiologic. Didn't get you, sir. What is the question? No, no. What I want to say is, do you still follow that uh, method of feeling the thrill? And then, if there's no thrill, then put some pepper wire and feel the thrill. Or you do you get a no, no, in no. an ultrasound and look it. No, absolutely. Feel for thrill. That is the time tested and the best method. If there is a good thrill, you know that everything is all right. If not, put some papaverin or xylocaine, uh, wait for a few minutes. Many times, the, once the vasospasm goes off, the thrill comes back. Even after several minutes, uh, the thrill doesn't come, then you are in trouble. Other thing, then, you know, we don't use all those uh, gadgets to do, although we can use, but nothing works like uh, the same old clinical sense. Touch for a thrill, look for a thrill. If thrill is not there in the a fistula, there's something wrong. Yeah, so I also use that, but uh, uh, I also use quite a bit of uh, Doppler. So anything more than 150 centimeters per second, you'll have a, actually a good thrill clinically. But um, I also keep doing the Doppler so that uh, the nurses and myself, we are much more oriented towards the Doppler. So I use it quite a lot. What are the tips to identify the site of bleed in vein injuries? Mm -hmm. So venous bleed uh, just doesn't uh, bring out a jet all the time. It's usually a slow filling bleed. Um, so all you need is, uh, is patience. So you just press it. Most of the time the bleed will stop. And then slowly you squeeze down to the point where you have the bleeding and you'll be able to see the hole. And um, I have not used anything very special in it. Invariably, my first uh, reaction when I see a bleed is to just take a pack and then press it. Um, so I think uh, one of my teachers used to tell us, as actually my dad used to say, the response to bleeding is three Ps, pack, press, and pray. So if you wait sufficiently, you can get things ready, you can still keep the hemodynamics, not lose much blood, and then slowly roll the gauze and you will be able to get that place where you can either clamp or you can uh, hold the bleeding spot or whatever it can be done. But just putting suction or a saline squirt in the midst of a heavy bleeding from a vein will not be able to identify. So my first choice will be to pack, press and pray and then go on. Sir, Pari? Yeah, I guess so. If it's a minor bleed, I think you pack and uh, wait. If it looks really big, then probably I would rather apply the clamp and then at least one side of the vein uh, from the, you know, the 
uh, front side of the vein, I put a clamp and then see because the pressure goes down and then the, the bleeding is going to be from the back flow here, then you will be able to visualize the bleeding point much easier. And then you should be able to uh, suture it. So if it's uh, more severe, put a clamp on the afferent side of the vein. And then most of the time it should be easy to find out. If you're not using a loop, then I think it's advisable that you start use the, uh, using a loop. Many times if you use a loop, it's much easier to find exactly the point, the, the point which is bleeding. I should narrate one experience here, uh, Ilango, that when I was in first year MS general surgery and I was asked to do a cervical node biopsy in a lady who's got CS cervix and, you know, hard node in the left uh, supraclavicular fossa. And there's no one was there. I was doing under local anesthesia and it started to bleed through a very small incision. My anesthetist said, apply some artery forceps. I would have applied about 20 artery forceps. After that, I realized that the hole has become much bigger. Now, uh, you know, there's a time we don't have vascular, I never heard of vascular instruments, as a matter of fact. The sisters, uh, you know, some junior sisters are sitting, she doesn't know either. You know, this is something which uh, young boys can come across where they're doing a cervical node biopsy. There's a gush of bleed. What would you do? I would just pack. <laughs> and? Uh, especially, and, and call for help. Call for help. As a young person, <laughs> call, I'll just call for help. I mean, even now, even now, um, it happens was uh, last week, uh, me and another uh, plastic surgeon, he wanted me to, uh, wanted to come and assist me in a brachiobasilic transposition. You do a brachiobasilic fistula and you transpose the fistulated vein back to a surface where they can actually cannulate. So I was doing that and there was a small uh, tributary from the deep vein to the basilic vein. So normally, I, he was just asking some questions. So I was tying with four zero silk on either side. And when we divided, everything looked good. Oh, he said, fine. And this one, fistula is already flowing, very large vein. And that knot slipped. For an unprepared AV fistula, we had bleeding. And then the clamps did not work. So I, I pinched the vein and I kept it and then milk the rest and then put another couple of clamps. When we were doing this, the other end also slipped. It was, a, so we just packed, we got our wits back together uh, and we said, probably we need one more hand. But luckily we were able to get both the ends and suture. So at that point of time, it's good to call for help. How, how whatever happens, another pair of hands, another pair of eyes, it's always good to have on the operating table. That's why we are a surgical team. <laughs> it's never so one surgeon. The moral of the story is don't blindly apply artery forces to bleeding anywhere. Absolutely. Which is, which is a reflex actually. We just try to put an artery forces and say, okay, he caught it. But in the process, you do more damage and you lose a bit of length as well. Absolutely. Yes, there is another very nice instrument to have on the operating field. It's called a Judd Alice, J-U-D-D Alice. It's a vascular Alice. Um, it's a phenomenal instrument. You know, it can help you hold the veins. It can help you close the defects. You apply three or four of them. Even large holes, you will be able to manage without clamping them. So they are a good instrument to invest in. Um, quite costly, but uh, they last a long time, Judd Alice. So, but uh, the situation which Patasar described, that's actually a nightmare for an MS surgery <laughs> PG. He has not forgotten it after so many years. That's the impact it will actually have on yeah, us. I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the story. You know, his blood is frothing from the neck area. Patient is under local anesthetic. My roommate is the anesthetist. You know what he did? Uh, you know, he quickly intubated, started uh, lines on all the four. He's a old lady with CS cervix with a hard node infiltrating the uh, internal jugular vein. And, uh, you know, it's a very sad story. Then uh, somebody ran and got one assistant who's, you know, it's a Saturday evening. One assistant came all the way and said, yeah, man, I've never seen this. I don't know what to do. 
let me call my friend. I know the names, they're still alive and actually they're members of Learning General Surgery. And the other senior person came and happily he scrubbed and said, he first extended an incision this big, then we could see the vein and all the vessels. Then he said, you want me to suture the vein or uh, ligate it? Okay. <laughs> I said, sir, I don't know what to do. Please ligate it, don't suture it. <laughs> Anyway, he ligated it and he said, you know, many years ago while I was working in Saudi, I had a similar experience and I did not know what to do. One Egyptian surgeon came and, you know, saved my day and he also told me the same story. <laughs> <laughs> so, until unless you injure a juggler where you do not know how to manage it. <laughs> true. Very true. Very true. <laughs> so, that's how we learn from each other. Yeah. So it's, it's an hour since we are online and uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, three session uh, vascular surgery Ilangu, and actually you spent uh, your Monday, busy Monday uh, to come in the evenings and uh, take this and uh, uh, we'll soon see you in another anastomosis in another Monday. Thank you so much and thanks Pari for being Thank there you, and Thank making you. the thing so effective and I'm sure uh, uh, many, many would have benefited by these lectures on vascular surgery. And as, yes, as, as the request goes, uh, you know, uh, you all together should come with a uh, thing on AV fistula. And again, uh, you know, I just, I'm trying to get somebody to do a coronary bypass and some microvascular and also a neurovascular as to how uh, these things are, uh, you know, there are you know, very good people available to teach us this. Thank you once again. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks.